were wounded with love for you, and as you are wounded with love for us. Guide this, we ask this through our holy, the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So the poem, Spiritual Canticle, it's filled with this longing of the soul for God, the wounded lover, you know, even from the very first stanza. Where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, and you were gone. And that captures uh, the spirit of a large part of spiritual canticle. And it's this wounded lover seeking uh, the divine bridegroom. And then the end of the stanza, the end of the, the poem originally was stanza set 35. And we hear that it's not only the beloved, it's not only the bride who's wounded with love for the bridegroom, but the divine bridegroom is wounded with love for the beloved. She lived in solitude and now in solitude has built her nest. And in solitude, uh, the Lord guides her. He alone, who also bears in solitude the wound of love. So to think about that, uh, the Lord has a heart wounded with love for us. And it's a great mystery, right? Because God is, okay, so just John the Cross comments on it here. That is, he is wounded with love for the bride. The bridegroom bears a great love for the solitude of the soul. You know, the soul choosing God alone, God above all things, and then finding God in all things, so through first loving him above all things. Uh, but he is wounded, okay, the bridegroom bears a great love for the solitude of the soul, but he is wounded much more by her love. Since being wounded with love for him, she desired to live alone in respect to all things. So he's wounded much more by, by her love. He does not wish to leave her alone, but wounded by the solitude she embraces for his sake and observing that she is dissatisfied with any other thing, he alone guides her, drawing her to and absorbing her in himself. Had he not found her in spiritual solitude, he would, he would not have wrought this in her. So this is what Haggerty is bringing out so well and that he brings these lines from John the Cross that can be kind of hard to, to grasp at times, and he kind of gives the context so we can understand them aright. Um, she's dissatisfied with any other thing, uh, seeking him alone in her wounded love for him, but the bridegroom bears that, that wound even more, that wound of love. Poem 7, we have that shepherd boy in you know, love with um, his to-be bride, and then uh, that refrain is, his heart an open wound with love. Father, yeah. so, um, and understanding the wound of the lover, um, like our soul's dissatisfied um, after we feel like the Lord has left, but yeah. when, when the bridegroom is wounded, yeah. is it still with a semi-negative? Right. You know, like, is it the wound that we are not loving him? Uh yeah, that he's hurting because we're not loving him above all else? Or is it a sweet wound? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so the, that's that's the mystery we're, we're going to try to open up. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, but no, yeah, it's... Yeah, because you know, God is complete. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our love. He's mm -hmm. completely happy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from all eternity. God is perfect. He doesn't change. He doesn't suffer in his perfect beatitude, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so then it's a great mystery to speak about God being wounded with love for us. And it's a mystery that, although we can't connect all the dots, I think it's important to, to not dismiss as just poetic language or something. So John the Cross, he does note that in Living Flame 114, uh, that speaking out of the wounding of the soul, that there's a wounding that is, that is even there in heaven. He says, um, the wounding that takes place in, in, during life, he says, not that this wounding is as essential and integral 
as in the beatific vision of the next life. So there, there's a wounding of love that's <laughs> essential and integral that will happen in the beatific vision, in that perfect union with the Lord. And so we deduce where all, neg all negative things will be taken away. So we do see then, um, okay, that kind of wound of love with all kind of the negative aspects taken away, elevated beyond all imagining that that does exist in God. And so it is a very profound kind of end to spiritual canticle, to the poem. Uh, and, and this, um, I mean, also just other references on this 13.2, 13.9, 31.9, Living Flame 114. Um, so God is perfect. He doesn't need us. Um, in a way, he's not hurt because he doesn't suffer any lack. But on the other hand, you know, he's not just perfect being. He, he is the God of love. And so there is something, you know, there is a tenderness in his heart for us. There is a, a tenderness. Uh, there is a longing. There is um, a, a thirsting. So Mother Teresa, this is a great mystery that she dwelt with. You know, in the, the wall of every MC chapel, you have those words, I thirst. And what's the mission of the MCs? What's our mission? To quench the thirst of Jesus. <clears throat> so Mother Teresa says, the reason of our existence is to quench the thirst of God. I don't say even Jesus or on the cross, but of God, the thirst of God. Try to deepen your understanding of these two words, thirst of God. And so this thirst of God is expressed on the cross it does come out, enters into our human history, especially on the cross where Jesus prays, I thirst. But in that manifestation of God, right, because the cross is a theophany as well, it's manifesting something of that mysterious thirst of God. Mother Teresa says, it is very important for us to know that Jesus is thirsting for our love. For the love of the whole world, ask yourself, have I heard Jesus directly say this word to me personally? Did I ever hear that word personally? I thirst. I want your love. If not, examine yourself. Why could I not hear? She also says that word, I thirst, has it penetrated into my heart. We are called to quench the thirst of God. The Catechism, you know, the beginning of its treatment on prayer, the fourth part, it says prayer is a mystery of thirst. Our thirst coming into contact with God's thirst for us. Pope Benedict takes up this mystery in his Deus Caritas Est, God is Love, where he talks about eros and agape. So those two kind of key Greek notions of love, eros, yearning, thirsting, Agape, the self-giving love. And Benedict says, you know, for a while, or you know, Benedict drawing on other people, say for a while they were kind of contrasted. Christian is about agape, love, self-giving love. Eros, uh, this yearning, this longing is something else. Uh, but no, to see that the two come together in the God who is love, uh, but that eros, that yearning, that desire being purified, elevated, and it found it in its perfection. In God. I'll just give you the references to Pope Benedict. So this is Deus Caritas S 9 through 10. God's eros for man is also totally agape. God loves, and his love may certainly be called eros, yet it is also agape. Um, he says, The philosophical dimension to be noted in this biblical vision and its importance from the standpoint of the history of religions lies in the fact that on the one hand, we find ourselves before a strictly metaphysical image of God. God is the absolute and ultimate source of all being. But this universal principle of creation, the logos, primordial reason, is at the same time a lover, with all the passion of a true love. Eros is thus supremely ennobled, yet at the same time it is so purified as to become one with the copy. 
Pseudo Dionysius, uh, among the church fathers, like seventh century or so, in the Divine Names, Book Four, paragraphs twelve through fourteen, speaks about the eros of God, the yearning, the thirsting of God. In truth, it must be said too, uh, Dionysius says that the very cause of the universe, in the beautiful, good, superabundance of his benign yearning, eros for all is also carried outside of himself in the loving care he has for everything. I'll just read that again. In truth, it must be said too that the very cause of the universe, the, in the beautiful, good, superabundance of his benign yearning for all, is also carried outside of himself in the loving care he has for everything. He is, as it were, beguiled by goodness, by love, and by yearning, and is enticed away from his transcendent dwelling place and comes to abide within all things, and he does so by virtue of his supernatural and ecstatic capacity to remain nevertheless within himself. So, the, you know, he's saying divine error that goes out of itself, himself, to us, you know, completely content in himself, yet his love goes out of himself to us, to our lowly places. St. Catherine of Siena will talk about the same thing, you know, God's like a drunken lover, who has fallen in love with, with us, what he has made, and he's a, as like a crazy lover pursuing us. And similar reality that Catherine of Siena is touching on. And so it's, it's a deep, uh, profound mystery, and we don't want to run into error here, because God is perfect. Um, he doesn't need. But on the other hand, our love isn't a matter of indifference to him. You know, the scriptures speak about us pleasing God. Delighting. You know, God delights in us. Zephaniah 3. Some of the Psalms. The Lord delights in you. I think 149 maybe. Uh, and others. <clears throat> and so, it's not the God of Aristotle. It's not God just simply understood philosophically like Aristotle. No, it's the God manifested, revealed in the sacred scriptures. The God who is like that passionate lover for his, his beloved, for us, while being you know, content in himself. So it's a profound mystery, and there's a danger for people to, especially the theologically um, sophisticated, it's a danger to, to think about you know, God so much as not needing anything and as that perfect being. Um, to lose that sense of, yeah, God is thirsting for my love. And we see what a difference that made in Mother Teresa's life. It's because she was convinced that Jesus is thirst on the cross. As she says, it's not just a past reality. It's a present reality. His thirst for us and our thirst for, for our love. And having that penetrate her heart caused Mother Teresa <laughs> to be what she was to live the way she loved. You know, she would have thought God was indifferent to her acts of love. She wouldn't have sacrificed as much. Right? If we think our acts of love and our acts of sacrifice are a matter of indifference to God, um, we're, we're going to be less prone to do it. And that's where a lot of people are. huh? Mm. Uh, but if we have a sense of, like, the Lord thirsting for my love now, thirsting for this this little deed of, you know, going out and serving the poor, pouring myself out in this way or that way, I'm going to be more prone to do it. And I'm going to be haunted if I don't do it by the thirst of Jesus for me, for you. So it's an important mystery, this mystery of God's heart being wounded with love for us, because he's not just the God of absolute being. He, he's a God. Uh, he is that as the God of love. So in his love, it's not a sense of neediness, but in his love, he allows his heart to be touched by what we do. So we can delight him. We can please him. And so to not to kind of lose that part of the mystery, because it, it, makes, it, it changes how we live. Mother Teresa says in her famous... Uh, Baranasi letter from March 25th, Feast of the Annunciation, 1993. I don't have time to quote it all, but um, for me, it is so clear. Everything in the Missionaries of Charities, Charity exists only to satiate Jesus. His words on the wall of every MC chapel, they are not from the past only, but alive, here and now, spoken to you. Do you believe it? 
If so, you will hear. You will feel his presence. You will feel his love. Let it become as intimate for each of you, just as it is for mother. This is the greatest joy you could give me. Mother will try to help you understand, but Jesus himself must be the one who says to you, I thirst. Hear your own name, not just once, every day. If you listen with your heart, you will hear, you will understand. Why does Jesus say, I thirst? What does it mean? Something so hard to explain in words. Right? So Mother Teresa, she, she appreciates the mystery. She's not just a simple believer who doesn't appreciate the theological complexity here and speaking poetically. No, she appreciates the difficulty. Something so hard to explain in words. I thirst is something much deeper than Jesus saying, I love you. I thirst is something much deeper than Jesus just saying, I love you. Until you know deep inside that Jesus thirsts for you, you can't begin to know who he wants to be for you or who he wants you to be for him. So there's a lot riding on this. And when it comes to the God of love, I'm prone to kind of throw my lot in with the mystics and how they describe it more than, let's say, the academic at his desk. Um, you know, who has greater contact with God's love? A saint like Mother Teresa. She's opening for our eyes to this great mystery and uh, to receive it as such. You know, it, I don't think it should surprise us <laughs> that when we come to the center of what God is, love, so we're going to find a mystery there. So I don't earn his love. He loves me because he's good, not because I'm good. Don't earn his love. But still, I can please him. I can bring joy to his heart. I can quench his thirst as he thirsts for my love, as he thirsts for, for souls, for others to draw closer to him, and I go out and serve them and help them. I can quench his thirst. And so to take that to heart, or as John on the cross describes it, you know, his heart is wounded with love for us. So a part of this is, yeah, God is with us in our kind of our own wounded love. He's with us in this. John the Cross points out that among lovers, the wound of one is the wound of, 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 an, of the other. Lovers share the same wound of love. You know, God's love to consider, um, charity is to consider the other as, as another self. That's what friendship is, to consider the other as another self. And God so considers us another self to him that we share the same wound of love. The other aspect of this great mystery of God's tender love is that we're able to please him, delight him. John the Cross has some beautiful stanzas on this, like uh, Spiritual Canticle 31, which we read. For a while. It's on the syllabus or somewhere, 31.9. But also there are other lines like this. He says this. So the stanza he's commenting on is, you consider that one hair fluttering at my neck. So the one hair is love. Fluttering at my neck, fortitude, the strength of the love. You consider that one hair fluttering at my neck. You gazed at it upon my neck and it captivated you. And one of my eyes wounded you. The eye of faith uh, wounded you. So John is capturing the, the mystery here. Yeah, the Lord's captivated by us. He's like that drunk lover in love with us. He's captivated uh, by us. Uh, but it's just that little string that binds him, that little hair, uh, that little lock of hair. Um, and uh, John continues as he speaks about, and one of my eyes wounded you. He says the eye refers to faith. She says she wounded him, wounded the Lord with only one eye because it's the soul's faith and fidelity toward God. And she, he says, um, if the soul's faith and fidelity toward God were not single, but mixed with some other human respect, it would not attain such an effect as to wound God with love. <clears throat> to wound God with love. Thus, it is only one eye that wounds the beloved, just as it is only one hair that captivates him. And so intimate is the love with which the bridegroom is captivated 
by the bride in this single-hearted fidelity, he be beholds in her that if the hair of her love captivates him, the eye of her faith so tightens the bonds of his captivity as to cause a wound of love, a wound of love in God. This wound of love is the result of the tenderest affection with which he loves her, which means he introduces her further into his love. So yeah, he, you know, he speaks about God as, as if being brought captive. Uh, she glories here in this union and thanks her spouse for this favor received from his hands. And she values highly the fact that he should be satisfied and captivated by her love. Consider the joy, happiness, and delight the soul finds in such a prisoner. She who for so long had been his prisoner. So God as if a captive, a prisoner to the soul. Uh, so bound by love. So, uh, whoa. And this is from John the Cross, who's so austere. So he's not saying these things to make us feel good. Uh, he's saying these things because they're true. Because they're true. And uh, he has, yeah, you know, stanza 32, love captures and binds God himself to us. Um, and so, yeah, it's a great mystery, but to take that to heart, that, yeah, our actions are not, not a matter of indifference to the Lord. But we can't please him. And that he is, he does thirst for our love. He does have that tenderness of, the, of his heart to be wounded by our love. While he is, you know, the perfect, all-sufficient uh, perfection of being as well. But it's the perfection of love that he is. So that's the, the wound of love, kind of opening up that mystery, even as it exists in God. And as that wound of love drives us to self-giving love among our neighbor, we have a beautiful connection between contemplation and the yearning for God and our acts of service, our sacrificial deeds of service for others. So this is what I want to talk about in the last 15 minutes. <clears throat> but it's, it's okay, yeah. I, um, yeah. We've got to require more. <laughs> any, well, any questions or comments on that? Do you, got, do you, you catch the mystery? And you catch the, the danger of reducing God from a mystery to something that we can grasp better? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he's the all-sufficient, perfect being. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, yeah. My question was just, um, what was the letter that you had quoted from, from Mother Teresa? Oh, the Varasani letter, I guess it's a city in India. It's from uh, March 25th, uh, 1993. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, Saint for our day, kind of bringing out this, this mystery. And she does say that somewhere, like, yeah, this is a neglected truth of God uh, that she's kind of helping to bring out. <clears throat> yeah, but we do see traces of it in all the ways I've described and earlier people, including John of the Cross. Right. It's, you know, it's John of the Cross who I trust to you know, tell me about the God who is love. It's Mother Teresa who I trust uh, to kind of open up that mystery before my eyes. So there's uh, one way in which a virtue prepares us for contemplation. So St. Gregory the Great has a famous line uh, that St. Thomas picks up and then others pick up after him, uh, that the act of life, and by the act of life he means the act of, the life of virtue, good deeds, the act of life is the best preparation for the contemplative life. So I want to grow in contemplation with the Lord. How do I do that? Well, by uh, a strong active life, the life of the virtues, building up the virtues. That prepares us for contemplation. But there's another way that we can't come to the fullness of virtue apart from grace that's received in contemplation. So we need, you know, virtue helps us to grow in contemplation, but on the other hand, contemplation helps us to grow in virtue as well. And our self-gift of, of love, the gift of ourselves to God, we can you know, bring so far with our efforts, uh, but our self-gift to God is not going to be perfect unless we have graces of contemplation and God taking us to himself 
God captivating us by his beauty and contemplation and so drawing us out of ourselves. Drawing us into his love. That's the only way our self-gift of ourselves to God will be perfected. So in spiritual canticle 20 to 21, right on the brink of spiritual marriage, there are some things that the soul just cannot shake. There are lower impulses, first movements, there are ways that it gets you know, distracted here or there, and it just can't get beyond that on its own efforts. The only way it can, the only way it can enter into spiritual marriage is by God captivating the soul. So he uses the image of the sirens of love, you know, so like the mermaids who would allure the sailors by their beautiful singing. And so the Lord has to like allure us, captivate us by his beauty for us to be drawn out of ourselves, for our fiat to be uh, completed, for it to be brought to perfection. So he says, by the pleasant liars in the siren song, I conjure you to cease your anger, not to touch the wall that the bride may sleep in deeper peace. And he says, we have already explained that by the pleasant liars, or harps, I guess, the bridegroom refers here to the sweetness bestowed on the soul in this state. And so it's a certain sweetness and contemplation. Uh, that, that charms our soul, that captivates us, that allures us. By it, he causes all the disturbances we mentioned to cease, all the wayward passions, all the distractions, or at least, you know, most of them, some strong ones. As the music of the lyres fill the soul with sweetness and refreshment and so absorbs and suspends her as to keep her away from bitterness and sorrow, so this sweetness takes such an inward hold on her that nothing painful can reach her. These words are like saying, may all bitter things cease for the soul by means of the sweetness I place in her. Now listen to this. We also said that the siren's song signifies the soul's habitual delight. He calls this delight the siren's song because, as they say, this song is so charming that it enraptures and enamors its hearers and makes them forget all things as though they were in a transport. Similarly, the delight of this union absorbs the soul within herself and gives her such refreshment that it makes her insensible to the disturbances and troubles mentioned. So yeah, it's being caught up, charmed by the Lord, that draws us out of ourselves and makes that gift of self complete. You know, a lot of self-denial goes into it, a lot of self-sacrificial acts of love for others enters into it. But it can't be brought to completion apart from the Lord drawing us in this way. And we can say, you know, if this is what's necessary for this final transition into spiritual marriage, um, can it be helpful also in earlier stages as well? And why not begin to try to live this as best we can now? Being caught up in, in praise and thanksgiving of the Lord, in contemplation of Him, as a way to draw us out of ourselves and help us now. So this, this similar dynamic, you know, it can be at work, you know, at all stages of the spiritual life. And it is at work. St. Bernard, he'll speak about, you know, temptations of the flesh that you suffer. He says, leap over them. You know, if you're caught up in love of God and captivated by him in contemplation, these things are forgotten. And that's the best way to overcome these temptations. You know, we can't always leap over them. Um, and there are other kind of ascetical practices of self-denial. But yeah, there's a point there. If you're caught up in contemplation and praise of the Lord, you know, lesser things begin to fade from your mind and heart. So to begin to live that now as best we can. <clears throat> I remember speaking to a, a nun one time, and she was saying how, because even nuns, you know, they, their schedule is not... They have some free time and how they, they arrange things is left to them a lot. And so she you know, was explaining just how it's difficult to make time for prayer. Right? Coming from a nun, we find that surprising. Because it's assuming, you know, there are things that have to get done in the monastery. And it's so easy for us to get caught up in things that have to get done. There are things that have to get done in your missions. And it's so easy to get caught up in that. And for that to become the, the primary thing. And so you don't make time for prayer. Even prayer that your kind of your your rule obliges you to. So she was coming. She was kind of talking about that, and I'm like, you know, sister, like this is why you came to the monastery to have time with the Lord, uh, to to pray. 
And then she comes back and she said, no, I came to the monastery uh, to make that gift of self to the Lord. Um, and so that silenced me. <laughs> but that was a pretty good comeback. Um, <laughs> she came to the monastery not to pray. She came to the monastery to give herself to the Lord. Wow, okay. Um, so I kind of leave, you know, humiliated dog with the tail. <laughs> and then I'm pondering it. So then, you know, a couple of days later, we meet again. So, <laughs> most of my stories end there with that humiliation. Most of my stories end not with the victory or the, you know, the good point, but with, with the humiliation. So the ones that kind of end in victory, I have to, I have to share. <laughs> no, and yeah, so, okay, yeah, she didn't come to the monastery to pray, but she came to give herself to the Lord. But sister, you're only going to be able to give yourself truly to the Lord uh, through this life of prayer and the time of prayer. And grace is received in prayer. That's the only way your self-gift to the Lord is going to become complete and whole. Right? So much of our hearts, you know, we have, you know, it's in our freedom and we make the effort, but so much of our heart is wayward. And it really takes the Lord uh, taking that, taking that up. And us corresponding, cooperating with grace. Uh, but yeah, the Lord, the Lord has to act in this way. So there's a way in which uh, virtue prepares for contemplation, but there's also a way in which contemplation brings us to greater virtue. And these virtues, it's not just like something I'm gritting my teeth to do, and you know, early on, just you know, doing the discipline to grow in virtue. That's part of it. But these these virtues are flowers in the garden of the Lord. And a result of deeper intimacy with the Lord are more beautiful flowers sprouting up in your soul, the life of virtue. And Gregory of Nyssa, St. Bernard, St. John of the Cross, they love to, to use this imagery of the interior garden. And the flowers are, are, the, are virtues and gifts, and they delight the beloved. They delight the beloved. So uh, St. Bernard, Sermon 22, speaks about the fragrance of Christ. Sermon 12, it's that fragrance as it comes to the church, as it bears the image of Christ. Uh, Sermon 70, he speaks about Christ as the lily, the lily of the field, exuding its fragrance. And from Sermon 70 and then to 71, then he talks about the church as being uh, smaller lilies, exuding the fragrance of the lily, the Lord Jesus, his fragrance. And so these virtues in the soul, in the interior garden, the soul delights the divine bridegroom, as he enters into our, our soul, as he enjoys dwelling within our souls. And so to see the life of virtue in those terms, you know, not just that hard uh, discipline, the last part of it, but to see it as, um, yeah, flowers of the garden and the Holy Spirit as that wind breathing through our garden and the fragrance of those virtues exuding before the Lord as a fragrant aroma, as incense in his sight but also exuding out into the world the lilies of these virtues and that attracted people to God. And we being attracted to God as we see that in others as well, as we sense that strange fragrance of Christ, the aroma of Christ. So we see in John the Cross, spiritual canticle 16 through like 21, 22. It's very, no, through like 16 through 24. This imagery of the interior garden, the virtues as these flowers comes, comes out. And so to see the life of contemplation as being a life of virtue. You know, it's not like John the Cross neglected the life of virtue. It's there from the beginning and it comes to its full flowering <clears throat> through contemplation. <clears throat> and he says in, um, I forget if it's 24 or 17, spiritual canticle 24 or 17, which you read that these virtues are shared in the properties of God. Yeah, so this is uh, number four of 24. Stanza 24, number four. These virtues are the dens of lion that protect the intimacy with the Lord, the contemplation, but they're also the flowers that, that come forth. John the Cross says in 24.8 that virtues established in God, each virtue is peaceful, 
gentle and strong. So we have that kind of paradoxical, gentle yet strong, these virtues, peaceful, gentle, and strong. And they bear the aroma of Christ. By the dens of lions, he understands the virtues possessed in the state of union with God. For the dens of lions are very safe and protected against all other wild animals. Thus, when the soul possesses the perfect virtues, each of them is like a den of lions, in which Christ, the bridegroom, united with the soul in that virtue, and each of the others dwells and assists like a strong lion. And the soul herself, united with him in these same virtues, is also like a strong lion, because she thereby receives the properties of God. Right? So the virtues are God's characteristic, the properties of God. As we become more like God, it's, it's growing in the virtues, which are reflections of God's attributes. It's like that wood placed in the fire. The fire uh, begins to share its properties with the wood. The wood begins to shine, to glow, like the fire does. It begins to heat. The wood begins to heat like the fire does. It shares the properties, and that's what's happening here. The soul begins to share more and more God's properties in the virtues. And these virtues have Christ dwelling in them. The dens of lions in which Christ, the bridegroom, united with the soul in that virtue, and in each of the others dwells and assists like a strong lion. So it's about um, participation in Christ. Participation in God, as he says in number five these virtues, and Christ is at the center of them. So the life of virtue is not just like human effort. It's part of our life in Christ. And so Christ is there in the exercise of the virtues. Elsewhere, uh, John the Cross says, you know, practicing the virtues contains a certain happiness and delight. It's what we're made for. Aristotle makes that point too. And so to appreciate that happiness, we have delight in the life of virtue to find Christ in the middle of that as well. He's the source of it. It's reflecting him, and he's, he's there in union with us uh, through, through those virtues. And then the soul, this is Spiritual Canticle 17, also bears that quality of I don't know what. Because it's not just human virtue, it's a share in, in Christ, a share in God's own properties. So he says in 17.7, uh, she is like she is in a pleasant garden, filled with the lights and the riches of God. And not only when these flowers are open can you see this in these holy souls, but they ordinarily bear in themselves an I don't know what of greatness and dignity. This causes awe and respect in others because of the supernatural effect diffused in such persons from their close and familiar conversation with God. Right, that's why people are attracted to, to Mother Teresa. They sense that I don't know what of God in her. And she exuded that fragrance of the mystery in her life. So that's the, the life of the virtues. And the life of the virtues are part of our self-gift to God. Right? We, we like the language now, the self-gift to God. John the Cross uses the same language. Um, but to see that, what does that self-gift look like? The life of the virtues including all the virtues, you know, theological virtues as well, but also the infused um, moral virtues. My friend, uh, Adam Idle, he's the Yale professor, he's a strong Thomist, but he, what he likes to do is take St. Thomas, and so he's working on a book now, St. Thomas on the Infused Virtues, but kind of what he's doing is interesting that he looks at stories from the Dominicans of that time. And the Dominicans, um, like Lives of the Brethren, were basically, they're, they're walking uh, in the power and the charism of the Holy Spirit. They're dreaming dreams and preaching out of dreams. Uh, these miracles are happening. Um, you know, times of just counsel, counsel from heaven. Uh, to solve a difficult situation. Anyways, all what we would call like charismatic gifts now, we, we find in like the lives of the brethren. These early Dominicans just flowed with the life of the Holy Spirit. So Adam Idol is looking at, you know, St. Thomas's teaching on the infused virtues and saying, you know, here's the context in which we understand that. Here's the context in which these infused virtues operate and the charisms that St. Thomas speaks of. Here they are in action and what it looks like. So then, you know, life, growth, and virtue is no longer so much about doing right or wrong. 
it's about living in the power of, of the Holy Spirit, living in Christ, and uh, all the mystery that that exudes as well. And that I don't know what quality about it all. So maybe I'll just close here now with just a little how John the Cross uh, describes this. The garden is the soul. The soul is a garden. As the soul above calls herself a vineyard and flower because the flower of her inner virtues supplies sweet tasting wine. Here she calls herself a garden because the flowers of perfections and virtues planted within her come to life and begin to grow. It should be noted that the bride does not say breathe into my garden, but breathe through my garden. For There's a considerable difference between God's breathing into the soul and his breathing through the soul. To breathe into the soul is to infuse graces, gifts, and virtues. To breathe through the soul is to touch and put in motion the virtues and perfections already given renewing and moving them in such a way that of themselves they, they, afford, they afford the soul a wonderful fragrance and sweetness. As when you shake aromatic spices and they spread their abundant fragrance that before this was neither so strong nor highly perceptible. It seems to them that she is a pleasant garden filled with the delights and riches of God. And not only when these flowers are open can you see this in the holy souls, but they ordinarily bear in themselves, and I don't know what, of greatness and dignity. The bridegroom communicates himself to the soul by means of the adornment of these virtues. The bridegroom communicates himself to the soul by means of the adornment of these virtues. He feeds on the soul, enjoying her company, transforming her into himself. Now that she is prepared and seasoned with the flowers of virtues, gifts, and perfection. So let's uh, close here with some prayer. Lord, we uh, offer ourselves to you. We offer our hearts to you as an interior garden for you to claim once more as your own, for you to adorn as you like with virtues and gifts. We open our hearts, Lord, uh, to be that interior garden that delights your heart. And we pray together as Jesus has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Peace. Yes, sir. Thank you.